Microphone test from the airport steakhouse. One, two, three, four. So, um, I don't know how much I'll use it, but we'll try it. First of all, the as we all know, this is honoring Orrin Lee Staley luncheon, and we're tickled to death to have him here. And to start the program off, I would like to ask Reverend Bill Sinning to make an invocation. Reverend Bill. <coughs> There weren't a whole lot of you uh, at one of the organizational meetings a whole lot of years ago. I read uh, one of the Psalms, uh, the gist of which uh, had to do with the fact that uh, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to sit around and complain about all the bad things that are happening to you unless you're willing to do something about it. Thank God, uh, and I say it reverently, there were people who were willing and courageous enough to do something about it. Let us pray. We thank you, our Father and God, that you give us faith to pray. We thank you for dreams and vision that come out of prayer, visions and dreams that impel us to action. We thank you for courage to begin actions that are for the good of all people. And we thank you for convictions that sustain us and give us the strength to follow our dreams when the easier thing to do would be to give up. We thank you for your sustaining power for this man, Orrin Lee. Now, as he passes on the responsibility of leadership to another, Give him good memories of all these past years, forgetting the things that, that aren't worth remembering. And for Devon, we pray that you will give him that same courage and conviction and leadership as he begins his arduous labor on the behalf of so many people. Bless us in this fellowship, this food to our use. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Bill. To start off, we'd like to have a welcome, and uh, we can think of nobody else uh, but the incoming president of the Chamber of Commerce to give it, so Alan Heaton. Austin, President Staley, President Woodland, friends, neighbors, uh, as I thought about what I was going to say here today, I... Uh, it occurred to me that for the past some years now, when I've been away from home, I've, uh, when I'm asked where I'm from, I say Corning, Iowa, and I've been proud to say Corning, Iowa, the birthplace of Johnny Carson and the home of the NFO. As uh, we pause here today and reminisce a little bit, it seems almost impossible that that association has lasted now almost a quarter of a century. and. Uh, on behalf of myself personally and uh, the Corning community, I certainly want to say, Orrin Lee, that we have certainly uh, enjoyed our association with you and with the organization, and uh, we uh, hope that as a community we've done all that we could to be supportive of the uh, NFO. And to President Woodland, I would like to say that we pledge ourselves to do all that we can as a community to be an equal partner with you in your efforts on behalf of agriculture. Thank you. Well, this gentleman doesn't know he's going to be called upon, and uh, before I say a few remarks, I thought maybe it might be appropriate at this time that uh, he might say a few uh, few words uh, because he was here when it was all started uh, he was right in that front lines and uh, he was the first regional president of NFO and uh, I'd like to have uh, Harry Grunneman say 
a few words if you'd like, Harry. Sure. You want me up there? Or? Wherever you want to be. Well, there's nothing like knowing you're going to give a talk. <laughs> Austin, I'll see you later. <laughs> First of all, I would like to reminisce just a little bit, if I might, about the origin of NFO and its contribution to agriculture. I've known this man for many moons. And I'll say this about Orrin Lee, and I'm going to sum it up quick. He's just one hell of a man. And I would like to... He came out of Missouri. I remember back in September or October of 55. I'm not sure of the date, so don't hold me to any of this. But as I remember him, he had on uh, khaki uh, pants and a shirt, and no necktie, had his sleeves rolled up, and he was determined to do something for agriculture. And as you know, he has done something for agriculture. Uh, they have things uh, in the mill uh, as I understand it, uh, through organizational efforts that will eventually solve the problem of agriculture. And the men that's in the field of farming will get a fair return for their investment. And regardless of who attempts to uh, accomplish this, we'll always know that uh, Orrin Lee is the guy that set up the structure to get it done. And uh, I'm sure he's had a lot of uh, assistance through his staff and uh, the people in the field that are actually farming. And he has done things that's unbelievable. I'm sure that uh, you'll find that Orrin Lee basically is a very modest person. Uh, he has uh, associated the NFO with our top people in the country. And when you mention NFO, it really means something. And uh, I can remember um, one time, Orrin Lee and you can too, when we were real excited about being uh, considered one of the major farm organizations. And that was when we were in our infancy. Well, if we were major then, what are we now? Uh, I can remember uh, Orrin Lee uh, on a lot of specific things. Uh, if I might, one of his characteristics was never show up to a meeting on time. Uh, I've changed. Uh, you'll never change. Uh, he is I kept him in cigarettes for a year and a half. I don't know who's been doing it since. <laughs> Cut him uh, off, Austin. <laughs> I'm not going to throw uh, <laughs> uh, I remember one time when we went to a meeting in Nebraska back in the early days. And I think we were supposed to speak there about 7 o'clock. I think that's when the meeting was called. I got off the tractor and I came in and we were ready to go at something like four o'clock. I think we got out of there about six and we had about three hours driving time. We didn't make it at seven. Uh, we didn't make it at eight, but nine o'clock we rolled in and uh, we had a good meeting. But uh, this is typical of Orrin Lee. He is so doggone involved in whatever he does that uh, Things, time just doesn't really mean a whole lot to him, and the clock is one of the things that always gets in his way. Um, we have, uh, I've seen him many times come in the office about 5 o'clock and want to have a staff meeting, 
And, uh, of course, everybody was ready to go home then, but he had been working probably till 3 o'clock in the morning, and he was still going to work till probably midnight and uh, then get another three hours of sleep. But uh, this is typical of Orrin Lee and uh, the way he goes about doing things. I could reminisce here for a long, long time, but uh, I know that you, uh, there's other people that's got things to say. But I just want to say that this community uh, and this person is proud to know Orrin Lee and proud of what he has done for agriculture. Thank you. I don't know. I think you boys who are leaders in the community, we've found a new master of ceremonies. Because <laughs> Harry didn't know that he was going to be called on, and his March remarks were very appropriate and uh, to the point. And uh, coming from Harry, it's, it's from all of us, too. I've got a few remarks that I'd like to say, and I'll go quickly. I'm like Harry. I... When my, I was on the outside looking in where Harry was on the inside looking out, so my remarks aren't as accurate, I'm sure, as, as uh, Harry's are. But anyway, I want to talk about Orrin Lee Staley, the man. The boy who came here, as I see him, as a naive little country boy, as you say in khaki with his sleeves rolled up, who believed in a lot of high American ideals. And all you had to do to write it was to tell the public and those things would write themselves. It would be a very short-term duration fight, but the, the uh, information would get out on the, the problems of the farmer and they would be solved either by the farmers himself or the big government or somebody would help along the way. But these things weren't righted. And today we're looking at a very hard-nosed, businessman who knows what has to be done of this horrendous task that has to be accomplished to make his dreams come true which is the farmers controlling the marketplace today Orrin Lee knows what power really is all we have to do is talk about like AMPI and milk SEC on grain trusts these huge grain companies who have whittled away at uh, trying to break an organization financially, and even other farm organizations who have taken their to made, made their toll felt. So it really is a tribute to you, Orrin Lee, that the organization is still alive and waging the battle of 23 years. Apparently, the concept is right and it would not have had such widespread attraction if it wasn't. I would like to say to you, I don't know how you did it, how you've kept this pace since 1955, and what Harry is saying, the lights were always burning at the NFO. When we go on trips or be here or there and they talk about the NFO, I said, you don't know what dedication is until you come and watch these guys coming in, working night and day on the principles and what they believed in. And I can say, thank God, Warren Lee was in the right place. He was the right person, and he was at the right place in the right time. My Uncle Dan was involved in many years in the early NFO. And he always says, said to me, as an individual, the measure of the man is moral courage. What is moral courage? This was his willingness to stand for what he believed under any kind of pressure, under any kind, even threatening of your life, to stand for what you really believe in. And I think no other man stands better for this than Orrin Lee Staley. He's been willing to challenge the big. He has stood for convictions on against the AMPI, the SEC, 
continental grain, even if it meant financial ruin. Tenaciously involved in his organization with the concepts of controlling the marketplace, which now seems to be everyone's idea. He expected dedication from his workers, and if they didn't give it to him, they weren't here the next day. And last but not least, Ornley, it's your loyalty to cause. The loyalty you have to your organization, and for us, your loyalty to your home away from home. You believed in grassroots from staff, for staff members, and you believed in grassroots relocation. We all agree here, but many didn't, and we appreciate this lo loyalty over the years. I cannot help, Orrin Lee, if you look back and just see what your leadership has accomplished, from a dissenter group of a dollar per year to an updated, modern, progressive administrative office who backs up your field staff and regional centers and who have finally given you a toehold in the marketplace. Yes, we salute you and admire you for these huge accomplishments which very few men could create. We too want you to know that you are our friend, and you always will be, and the door of this town will always be open to you. You're the best, and we want to wish you all the success in the world to any endeavor in which you choose to take. Now, at this time, I'd like to have Mike Miltner, uh, who is now the chamber president, make an award to you. <clears throat> well, on behalf of the chamber, uh, it took a little doing, but we got this thing here today. I'd like to read to the, the people out here what it says. Orrin Lee Staley, for outstanding leadership and devoted service to rural America and friendship to our community, we hereby proclaim you to be Mr. National Farmer of America, the Corning Business Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're not going to let you get away, Lauren Lee, without saying a few words, so you're right up there. Well, I won't say very many, Austin. Uh, <laughs> It's been a pleasure to have been a part of the community uh, as a visitor, I guess you might say, because uh, many of you, <coughs> and I do have a, from one of the few times I've had the flu, and well, there have been a few uh, press calls, you know, and so I've been on the phone a few hours. There are not very many things that I think are unusual. There are things that I do that I think are just good common sense, common decency, and uh, I try to carry them out in that manner. As Harry was talking here, I couldn't help but think uh, those that thought I sought the office, I really came and dressed a tar to campaign, didn't I, Harry? because I remember those khakis and coming in and I expressed a few ideas and the first thing I knew was I was vice president of a regional group. And then we grew pretty fast in a couple, three months. We were going to have a national convention and Harry came to me one night at midnight and I've always greatly respected him and said, I think you should be president. You remember what I told you, Harry? I won't take it unless you'll be vice president. And so Harry accepted it. And we, I think, did remarkable things quickly, Harry. And it was your great support and great understanding and some of the problems we visited about then and a moment ago. But we overcame them and overcame them very rapidly. You know, there are a few things that I'm proud of. I'm proud to have been a part of the community. 
because it's a kind of a community I believe in. And although I haven't gotten to know too many of you intimately, I lost a few bucks on liar's poker, you know, the guy that's a shark. I never, I used to be a very clean guy. I played a little penny ante poker in the service. I got involved with a few of the sharks, or, I mean, great gentlemen around this community, you know. And, uh, but I, they don't play high stakes, so I didn't lose a lot of money. I wouldn't play high stakes because I played to relax. And then I took up another bad habit, and that's golfing. You know, uh, to be a farmer and be a golfer is uh, not usually one, of, one that you associate that way. I've enjoyed it all. The thing that I'm really proud of, as the press asks the question, you've been a controversial figure. And I tell them I hope so. Because I've tried to give leadership that everybody knew where they stood, the public knew where they stood, where we stood, and I believe that this is one thing that's really lacking in this country today, that leadership will not take a firm stand, because when you take a firm stand, it means there's going to be disagreement, and it means there's going to be discussion and debate. But if leaders don't take a firm stand, and usually leaders in the political life that take a firm stand don't last but one term. Just something in passing else that I'm proud of, and I don't think the organization should ever be in a large city for two or three reasons. One is, if you're going to be a farm organization, you ought to be where when you walk out in the street, a farmer can say to you, you doggone dumb idiot. You're really boo-boo. I think it's important to keep the integrity of the organization. Not that it's impossible in large cities, but you can't do anything in Corning, Iowa that everybody doesn't know about the next morning, you know. And so that enforces integrity. It enforces a type of socializing that is important that it be work. If they want to socialize, they can go somewhere else a ways off. I've kept the integrity of the organization from several standpoints. We've never had, we've had some pretty close calls. But I was always able to get the people out before they caused the organization any embarrassment or they caused this town any embarrassment. Because I was determined that it wasn't important whether you won or lost, it was important how you played the game and above all. That you didn't, there's no sin or nothing to be ashamed of for losing, but only if you lost in a manner that hurt the reputation of many, many people. All the people that were involved, and that would include Corning, Iowa. <laughs> the integrity of the organization, I pass it on without one single commitment that's been made under the table or in any way that Devon Woodland has to worry about. There's no skeletons. I'm proud of that integrity. I think to the community, we contributed one thing that I hope we have, and that is the quality and caliber of people that we brought to this community had to live up to the standards expected, or as you said, they weren't here very long. We missed on a few, but not many. I think the training that we gave many, many people in this community, and I can tell you, that the first job that a girl out of high school or college gets 
or man is going to determine what type of an employee that person is for the rest of their life. If there's not discipline, if there's not job responsibility, and they get to operate in that type of an atmosphere very long, they never change their habits. And to that, we have contributed. The other thing, people are saying, well, what about Ornley Staley? What is he going to do? What did he do before? He farmed. I'm proud to be able to say that my only investment is in the farming operation. I don't have any outside investments, and I wouldn't have had any outside investments as long as I was president of the NFO. I never played the Board of Trade for a single time, nor in anything resembling it. Those are the type of integrities that I've stood for and uh, that I believe in. But the odd thing about all of it is that I never saw a public life. Harry can attest to that. Why? Well, I had public life. I had a lot of it before I came to Corning, Iowa. I fed my first calf as a nine-year-old boy, club calf. I rented the first farm when I was 12. I went to school at Maryville. My children all graduated there with business degrees. And I went there, my father attended the first term in Maryville, and I live in the home or house that I was born in. It's a fourth generation. I gambled everything with the NFO. I tried to run my business on a pretty conservative basis over the years. Accumulation step by step of the family, and we try to do the things together. But the one thing that I didn't want was public life. When I came back from the service, I was appointed in a loan committee for FHA, and I got every free gratis job there was in Andrew County. There wasn't one that I missed that I know of. And I decided I was going to take a look at politics. And I went to one political meeting in St. Joe, Missouri. Slipped in, sat down in the court house room there, and I watched. And I never saw such a farce going on in my life. As each one patted the other one on the back and tell them how glad they were seeing, they hugged each other and, and all that thing, oh, how great you are, and I could see the dagger in their hand behind them, you know. <laughs> and I knew I wouldn't last long in politics. That's the last one I went to. And then my wife and I decided we were going to spend our time with the purebred cattle, church, and the lodge. And I was determined that that was it. I'd had it. I was going to pay attention to business and nothing more. And then there was something started up here in southwest Iowa. And I did stroll in late to that first meeting in Maryville because there were no seats left, and I sat down on the ground. And I gave an idea or two behind the scenes, but they couldn't get me out in the open. I'd also, off the record, been active in Farm Bureau and opposed their policies. Been, among other things, president of the County Farm Bureau. The press never picked that up much, and the Farm Bureau didn't want it. <laughs> i tell you why I opposed their policies and upset their state organization uh, tremendously. And uh, five of us went down to the convention, didn't know anybody, only the purebred people through the state of Missouri. And I was always then sure that people were going to have their say. Because if we'd have had a free open say in that convention, we did change the Farm Bureau in the state of Missouri. First time I'd ever gone to a convention. I'd been county president a couple years, 
but I hadn't had time to go to their convention. And my lateness was never because I wasn't busy, it was because I just had too many things to do. So they wanted me to speak, finally, not long, before I yielded, but reluctantly. And the only reason I ever spoke, Harry, I, think I, I don't think I ever told you, I was showing cattle at the same time an American Royal, walked into the mule barn, a guy by the name of Smokey Woods at 5.30 in the morning, and I'd been out to a meeting in King City, Missouri, the, to the Farm Bureau, or to the NFO meeting. Smokey Woods, director of livestock, who I had opposed in the policy and decision, he said, I heard you were out with the Pitchfork Boys last night, only three hours earlier. So they had a pretty good tab on me, I guess. And I turned to Smokey, and they'd already asked me to speak, and I turned to Smokey and I said, you know, Smokey, I'd rather be out with the Pitchfork Boys than a bunch of people that have been deceiving farmers over the years. And I didn't pay much attention to showing cattle that day, and I didn't even know who to call, but I called them as soon as I got out of the show ring and said, if you want me to speak, I'll speak. And that's how it all happened, Harry. And so, I never had any intention of making a public career. So what I did this week, last uh, week, the decisions, the weeks before, and particularly the week before Christmas, I made nine meetings. But it goes back to August 3rd. When I said very clearly to 10,000 people there that the systems and structure of NFO are ready, that we brought in the professional people, the know-how, the best there is in dairy, hogs, cattle, and grain, and our members are getting the best prices available to farmers. I said that several of us want to know I speaking primarily Orrin Lee Staley. That whether or not support is going to become, come rapidly, <clears throat> overwhelming support to be able to reach the goals by the 1st of March. And if the farmers aren't going to give that support, we want to know so we can go back to our own farm. The support increased. But my goals are big, I think vital to the farmers, and I thought a lot about it. And I thought, well, over the years I've taken firm stands, I never yielded in what I believed. I was not going to any way, in any way, yield on anything that I believed was, was wrong or that I didn't believe was possible or could not be made possible. And so many people had said they would join the NFO if it wasn't for Staley. I heard it. It didn't really hurt me. It never really bothered me. Because if there's anybody that's got uh, self-discipline control of the mind, I think I do have. I've always been able to shut it off when I wanted to. When I began to get too tired, I was able to shut it off. And sometimes it would almost get too much. And I'd catch myself, and I either got some diversion or I started my mind thinking about something else, but some form of mental relaxation or mental change. So it meant I came down to a very realistic viewpoint. And that was I didn't want to look back and say to myself, it might have happened to myself, but you stupid fool. You stayed around too long, and too many people would have helped if it hadn't have been for you. 
I didn't want that to happen. Another thing that I didn't want to happen, above everything else, I made that statement August 3rd, and over the years, whether it was a holding action I said we were going to hold, or whatever it was, I had a 100% record in one thing. And that one thing was whatever I said and whatever I committed, it came about. And I knew when I was saying that August 3rd, I was putting all the chips on the table. Because I was either going to drive it through, I wouldn't have had to have the 30%. We've made great gains. We're making them now. But I wasn't going to ever have the people say, well, Staley tried to bluff us, scare us. Because he maybe it would be interpreted by some, he threatened our, uh, that he might quit or he might do this. There was never going to be any threat. I intended to live up by up to it when I made that statement August 3rd. And I knew it was a tough grow. And I felt that those nine meetings before Christmas and everything else I did, that I was living up to my part of the responsibility. I have no regrets. I'm proud of our accomplishments. I think we've done the impossible up to this point. And I had one other reason that I clearly said to the family. I said, you know, if I can't get enough help and I keep butting my head into the stone wall, some of these days they're going to send me home in a casket or I'll be feeble and they may have a big funeral. There might even be a thousand people there, you know. And I said, you know, the only people that will really miss me three weeks later is the family. The son lives a half a mile from there with a grandson. I live in the home, I, say, I believe I said that I was born in. If I haven't, I'll say it again. The daughter and her husband live only 12 miles in the real estate business. The daughter just graduated from college not long ago. And so I wanted to show also those people that said Staley has to have it for power. He has to have it for his own prestige. You know, I get fun out of proving people wrong sometimes. I've done it so many times. Why? Not for personal satisfaction. But any time that you get in a corner where people can always predict what's going to happen, you also lose your leadership ability. And I've never been in that position, you know. Anybody that followed my trail and one of the ladies that used to help me said, you know, I can predict you 90% of the time, but I'm always scared to try to predict you because I don't know what you're going to do that other 10%. Well, it's because I've tried to be in a position to change positions if somebody could present to me something that was better. Well, I've appreciated it. Very one important thing. The man that has become president is a man whose integrity is above reproach. He's just as conscientious as I have ever been in the dedication of cause to people. Because if he hadn't have been, he wouldn't have been vice president because I would have never accepted a vice president that wasn't of the same mold that I was. If they'd elected him, they could have elected another president too, you know. And I exercised that prerogative. 
and he's well trained. He spent the time in the field. He spent the time getting prepared for the last several months of tough administrative responsibilities and became involved in the planning. And I have assured him that any time that he wants help, that it will be forthcoming from me in any way that I can give it, by telephone or any other way. But I tell you one thing, that I want Devon Woodland to be his man, and there'll be no effort on my part to in any way make it appear or for it to be happening where I'm trying to run the NFO behind the scenes. That would be unfair, and I will not do it. So I guess that I can say that I have, not guess, I can. I don't regret, have any regrets. There's one thing I've been able to adjust to and that I believe in, and I'm saying more I today, and I never did like testimonial dinners, and I never thought it was a bunch of BS, and here I am, you know. Uh, they don't impress me. It never impressed me to go to the White House, and I didn't believe in the word I because I never accomplishes anything. But I guess I am in the position of having to say a little about I today. <laughs> And so, tomorrow is another day. It's a new day with new challenges. And all that I have ever lived for is tomorrow to make it a better day than today was or yesterday was. My mind is not going to rot away. I want to die with my boots on. And out of all this is the amazing thing that, as far as I know, Mr. Don Mum came in yesterday and the day before, very nice gentleman that he is. You know, as you, when you hang up your shoes or you die, they talk a lot better about you, you know, than when you're in the midst of things. And he come around and he said, Mr. Staley, is there any health reasons involved? And I smiled and I said, Don, this is one time a leader is not pulling out because of health reasons. I am healthy as I can be. I don't know a thing in the world is wrong with me. And I'll tell you why I resigned, but there's no health reasons involved. And I'm mighty proud of it. And I say, Austin, to you a couple <clears throat> things in conclusion. One, there's a few people that have had a great influence on my life. On my public life, Dan Turner 